Hey, it's me, Kirby, and as promised, I'm continuing with my series talking about tongues, and I thought I would kick it off by just giving my testimony on how I um, started speaking in tongues. I thought I'd share that first, and then we'll move into talking about the different uh, topics and controversies surrounding tongues. So uh, let me share that, share my testimony. Um, I was raised in a Pentecostal household. Um, my mom and dad um, were Pentecostals. We came up in the Church of God in Christ, Kojic. Um, as, if you're watching this, that's a Pentecostal denomination. Uh, it's probably one of the largest in the country, probably around the world, um, next to the Assemblies of God. Uh, Kojic is um, a predominantly uh, African-American uh, denomination. But I grew up Kojic. And um, I, uh, my mom and dad were saved uh, to the best of my ability. And if any of my sisters are watching this or if any of the people that I went to church with uh, are watching this, but to the best of my ability, while we were Pentecostals and we believed in the gifts of the Spirit and in the operations of the gifts of the Spirit, I did not recall seeing a whole lot of speaking in tongues uh, as a kid. Um, I remember when my mom and dad would have prayer at the house, people would come over. And even during those times of prayer, there wasn't a whole lot of praying in tongues. Um, and stuff like that. There would be Rhonda and Shonda coming in on a Honda. So there would be maybe that little utterance um, said and, and said, but there wouldn't be a whole lot of uh, speaking in tongues uh, coming in. Again, the church believed in it. Um, nobody denied in it. Um, being Pentecostals, and I guess you would say more holiness than anything we be, where they believed in being sanctified, being looking, being sanctified, set apart from the world. That was sort of the big emphasis uh, for us and my growing up as a Pentecostal experience. Um, one of the big things that used to be critiqued, uh, you know, like they would they, they would always compare, like they would say that we were different than a Baptist folk because the Baptist folk didn't live like nothing. <laughs> and at, when I was a youth, I didn't really attend any Baptist churches, so I wasn't sure. And I was just taking the words of my uh, parents and you know, like those in our circle of friends. Most of my other parents' friends kind of belong to either Holiness Church or Pentecostal Church. Uh, also, and so, uh, <clears throat> so, but I, I touch on the Baptist thing a little bit later. But, <clears throat> but growing up with uh, uh, the church that I grew up in, they believed in it, but I didn't see a whole lot of it coming up. The saints, they were faithful in prayer, they were faithful in serving God, they were faithful uh, in wanting to see people be saved and set free. Um, they were bold. They were daring. Um, I share this one story again. If one of my sisters is watching, they they can um, comment below uh, and clarify the story for me. But I do remember there's always this one incident that we always talk about in my family that uh, one of my sisters was out at a club. And so my mom didn't want her at the club. And so she got together with some of the other saints and they went to that club and they surrounded the club and we just started praying, was praying for all the people in the, in the club. That was the kind of, um, so it was, that was the kind of stuff that the saints and my church were doing. And, uh, and the ending of that particular story was that the club manager ended up, hey, had, he sought my sister out until the age she had to go <laughs> to get rid of, to get rid of all the uh, people outside the club praying. Uh, another, and another, I'm sharing, I just want to share this because again, the, what I think, uh, the, the mindset of my mom and them had as far as allowing the Holy Spirit move through them was a sense of great holy boldness. Uh, so that, that's why I shared that story. And this other story that I saw, um, we came up in kind of a rough neighborhood. At that time, um, Park Place was kind of a rough neighborhood. And so I never forget this day. 
um, there was a guy beating up his girlfriend. And uh, my mom intervened to stop him from doing that. <clears throat> and so uh, he pulled out a gun. And uh, my mom didn't speak in tongues to the best, again, to the best of my uh, remembrance, my mom didn't speak in tongues or anything like that. But she just kept saying the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. So the guy eventually put his gun away and got in his car, drove off, left the girl alone. My mom ministered to the uh, young lady. It's that holy boldness like that. That's what I saw the Pentecostals in my life doing coming up. Um... Uh, I eventually uh, got saved in 1986 is when I uh, um, made my uh, confession of faith, I would say that. And I, I'll explain my conversion in two parts. I had what I call my head conversion, which happened this way. It was the last day of school, June 1986. Um, my math teacher, had, uh, I needed to pass one class and it was math. The math teacher had said, if you want to know if you're passing or not, stay behind and I'll give you the results of your final test. And so I wanted to know um, what my score was. So I stayed behind and when I got up to her desk, she graded my paper. She looked at, she said, you passed by the skin of your teeth, you got a D. And so I was happy. And now, uh, um, so uh, I had made a little bargain with God that if I pass this class, I'd get saved. So she told me I had the D. So I went to church that Sunday <clears throat> after when the Pat when Bishop Willis had gave the uh, altar call I went to the altar and uh, I gave my life to Christ and I call that my head conversion because you know, like I just ate God if you let me pass I get saved so I was like I'm feeling uh, I'm fulfilling my end of the bargain God let me pass so I'm getting saved but later that summer, I would say, I don't know, some it was summertime. That's all I remember was summer. It was hot, and me and another friend were going to church. I was going to his church, and his church was closer uh, to my house. It was within the neighborhood, I should say. And so as we were walking to church, uh, another one of our friends saw us. And so he stopped, and he asked where we were going. We told him we were going to church. And so he said, okay, fine. Can you guys pray? You know, I say a prayer for me while you're there. So we go and I sit down and pastor gives his sermon at the conclusion of his sermon. He gives the altar call to where he invites um, the people to either come up to get saved or just to get prayer. So I said, OK, that's right. My friend said he wanted prayer. Let me get up and go tell the pastor to pray for my friend. As I get into the line, as I get into the line and as I get closer to the front of the altar to where the pastor is praying for people i feel myself wanting to cry i don't know why i want to cry i'm having this conversation in my head asking why do you want to cry um, um there's nothing to cry about you're just going to tell him to pray for so and so don't cry there's no need to cry just tell him you, you want prayer for so and so and so i just keep i'm having this conversation the whole time i'm in line because i keep feeling myself wanting to cry <clears throat> and so when I finally do um, get before the pastor of that church, uh, uh, Elder Perkett, now he's going on to be of the Lord now. Uh, so Elder, per Elder Perkett tells me, uh, and those of you who are watching this, you remember Elder Perkett, uh, <coughs> uh, that, that grew up uh, and I, that grew up with me. Um, Elder Perkett asked me, um, so young man, what can I pray with you about? I don't know what, the waterworks just turned on. I started crying. Snot bubbles and everything started coming out, and I tell uh, Elder Perkett I want to be forgiven. And so he prays, so he leads me through the center prayer. And uh, so I count that day as my heart conversion day. So that's the day that, that I really, um, really uh, had, had a conviction of my sin and gave my heart over to Jesus Christ. So that's 1986. Two years later, I joined the military, 1988. I joined the military and, um, excuse me, while I'm in the military, um, <clears throat> the, the first Gulf War kicks off. Uh, so that's about 89, 90. Somewhere around there, we get shipped off to the Port of Daman. That's where we're at. <clears throat> 
And so while we're there, I'm attending um, this one guy's hosting Bible study in his room. There are these two reservists guys who are there. They're both ministers. Uh, thank, uh, I know one guy was, at this time, I, I know I know he was a Word of Faith pastor, but um, and the other guy was, I, I think he was an Episcopalian pastor, uh, but he believed in speaking. He believed in the gifts. Um, so uh, it's a black and a white guy. And so they are leading the Bible studies uh, in the room. And so at the conclusion of each study, you know, like they were, you know, like ask, have prayer and stuff like that. And so this one particular night, they are teaching on the gifts of the spirit. And so at the conclusion of their teaching, they say, hey, who here doesn't have their prayer, prayer language and would like to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? So I and a couple of the guys go up to receive prayer for our baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't speak in tongues that night. The other guys do. Um, <clears throat> they receive it. Um, they're speaking and I'm still praying in my understanding. So we depart and he said, hey, if you didn't speak, don't worry about it. Doesn't mean you don't have the Holy Spirit. And we'll touch on that uh, in another lesson. Are you not saved if you don't speak in tongues? Now, of course, Mom, I'm sure most of you viewing this are mature believers. You know the answer to that is already. But we'll touch on that um, in one of our lessons coming up. <clears throat> so... But anyway, I, I say it's maybe a week, maybe even two weeks later, I'm in my room just praying uh, to myself. And it's, uh, the other guys are out on duty and I'm in the room by myself. And so I'm praying, I'm reading my Bible, and all of a sudden, tongues just begin to flow out of me. Uh, it just began to flow. And I, I was awestruck. I was like, wow, I was amazed. I was like, oh my God, it just happened all of a sudden. And so I, so when we go back to Bible said I, you know, I can share it with the pastors and I mean with the uh, guys who was leaving, but well, they were pastors, but I share with them how it happened and stuff. And I'm just fully amazed and everything. Uh, so, <clears throat> so I began speaking in tongues and I just began to incorporate it into my daily prayer life from that point on. Uh, every time I prayed, I would spend time praying in tongues. I spend prime time praying in my understanding. From that point forward, um, I, that's what I've uh, always done. So that was my introduction into tongues uh, and how, is, how I've or, always operated in it. Now, uh, <clears throat> I sh when I um, want to say that when I, uh, the way I would conduct myself if I went to a church that I, like I said, I, coming up, we talked, uh, I was always taught, like, a Baptist folk, like, one, they didn't live holy, <laughs> and I share this anecdotal story, uh, as I said, I, I joined the army, and of course, when you join the military, you, you can't, you, you, you kind of get a little culture shock because you start seeing different stuff that you weren't quite aware of when you lived in your own little bubble. Uh, <laughs> two things are <laughs> always, two things that uh, kind of always crack me up when I think about it. One, I'll never forget this. I was, we were in basic training. And so um, this is in the 80s, late 80s. And so <clears throat> I'm in the line and we're all, all waiting to make this one phone call that we can make during the week. Uh, no, we're not doing the week. We can make more than one. I can't remember. There was something going on that we can only make one phone call. And so everybody was in line, standing in line. And of course, it's pay phones at the time. Want no cell phones. So it's pay phones. So I'm um, standing in line. There's a guy in front of me and I uh, uh, hear the guy. And the man, I mean, he's just giving a tirade of cuss words in his conversation on the phone from, and I'm listening to the conversation and I'm of the opinion that, hey, this guy is talking to one of his homeboys from all the stuff that he's saying, he's talking to one of his homeboys from the way he's cursing and all that other good stuff, he's talking to one of his homeboys. And so at the conclusion of his call, he said, all right, ma, I love you too. And I was just blown away. I said, wow, you mean to tell me people talk to their moms like that? I said, oh my God. 
That was my one culture shock. <laughs> my second culture shock, and I know this is, I, I know I'm digressing. I just want to share this because it's kind of funny to me. Uh, I didn't know people paid for dogs. I did not know people actually spent money on pets. I didn't know that. I did not know until I joined the military, people paid money for dogs and cats. When I was coming up in the neighborhood that I grew up in, we just simply found them. It was a stray dog, a cat, you claimed it, it was yours. I never thought, I did not know. That was it, I'm sorry. I didn't know people paid for pets. But anyway, <laughs> all right, back to the subject at hand. We was in boot camp, and so, uh, no, I'm sorry, This that didn't happen at boot camp. I was at my, uh, I got to a duty station at Fort Lewis, and I went to my very first Baptist church. Um, uh, uh, there was this girl I was trying to talk to, and so I went to her. Uh, she said her dad was a pastor, and so I went to her church. <clears throat> and after the church, she, she said her dad was a pastor, and after the church service was over, he came outside and lit up a cigarette, and now my mouth just dropped because coming up Kojic holiness, you don't smoke. He had a beer. I'm like, what? Oh my God, he's drinking a beer? So, all right. So in my head, I'm thinking Baptist folk. Now that's confirming to me what I said earlier, that Baptist folk can really ain't say. I'm like, oh my God, this man ain't no pastor. <laughs> he ain't for real. <laughs> he's drinking and smoking <laughs> right after the service. <laughs> so. And so uh, that was my mindset. That, that, that just solidified everything my mom and dad and uh, other people used to say when I was coming up about Baptist folks. Again, I've learned different uh, since I've grown in my walk with Christ. So, but anyway, and I was saying all that. Uh, now, why did I get on the even thing about talking about Baptist folk? Uh, about that one in incident, I can't remember. But, uh, oh, that's right. I got on that story because I knew that Baptist folk didn't believe in speaking in tongues. So when I would go to a Baptist church or any other church that I knew wasn't Church of God in Christ and I could speak in tongues from that point on, once I could speak in tongues, I just wouldn't pray in tongues. If the church called us, to, if the pastor wanted people to pray, I just wouldn't pray in tongues. That's how I conducted myself. I just wouldn't pray in tongues in that church if I knew that that wasn't that church's practice. If they did, if I felt they didn't agree with um, speaking in tongues, I just wouldn't do it there. Uh, out of one, out of respect for like for that pastor and his leadership, and of course, I just want to respect like you know, my fellow brothers and sisters. I didn't want to do anything to offend them, so I just wouldn't do it there. So that was the purpose of bringing that up. And so um, I'm going to end this video there. And next week, that's what we'll talk about. Um, should we pray in church, in tongues? And is there a prayer tongue? So we'll touch on those two topics next week. We'll examine the scriptures um, about that. And we're going to, I want to kind of give it a, a really honest critique um, there, uh, in doing my, preparing my research on this, there's some really good points that's brought out on both of those. And, um, but I still think, I'll share it, I'm going to share it all next week, but I, but there's still some things that, um, that I don't think quite just seal the deal that, uh, that our, uh, opponents, um, have uh, against it okay so that's the end of this video thank you for watching before you go i want to extend an invitation to you if you're in the hampton rose area i'd like to invite you out to our men of valor breakfast on february 25th at nine o'clock i'm going to have Brian Rogers, he's the co-author of the ABCs of Marriage. He's going to be here sharing with the men of Living Destiny um, how to have a godly marriage, relationships. He's going to be touching on some of that with us. So again, that's February 25th um, at Living Destiny Church, 5 
50 Little Creek Road in Norfolk, Virginia um, from 9 a.m. We usually go to about 11. I'll be on the Blackstone cooking up breakfast and it's free and open. And again, if you're open, if you're in the area and you would like to attend, you are invited. All right. So thank you. I look forward to next week to, um, discussing this topic on should we pray in church and do we have a is there a prayer talk? All right, YouTube, thanks for watching.